Hey there, NASCAR fans. Have you got your copy of the latest edition of NASCAR Pole Position Print Magazine? If not, there's no better time than now to subscribe at PolePositionMag.com. NASCAR Pole Position is the only print magazine covering NASCAR. Officially licensed by NASCAR, NASCAR Pole Position Magazine is published throughout the NASCAR season, and each edition is an instant collector's item, backed with great feature stories and photography. The magazine is even mailed to you in a poly bag for those who love to collect NASCAR memorabilia. At PolePositionMag.com, you can even find past issues available to purchase. Get your subscription to NASCAR Pole Position and get great NASCAR content delivered straight to your mailbox throughout the season. Learn more at PolePositionMag.com. That's PolePositionMag.com. Hey y'all, Rick Houston here, and I want to tell you about my new show, the Moonshine and Motorsports Racing Podcast. I've partnered up with the state of North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources to help uncover the history behind moonshining mountain boys, professional wheelmen, and the backwoods and city lights of the Tar Heel State. In the first episode, I sat down with Winston Kelly at the NASCAR Hall of Fame, for a little behind-the-scenes gossip about Junior Johnson's engineering skills. He's got two things in his hand, pipe wrench and channel lock pliers. And they weren't new. They yeah. had been, they had been yeah. around the block a time or two. What so, the first deal they built, I bet? No, no. You know, you, I think they were, they had, the, the pliers had been red before, but paint had worn off. And in the second episode, I talked to a professional hillbilly, a.k.a. Dr. Daniel Pierce, of UNC Asheville to find out the real history of moonshiners and their battles with the revenuers. He wrote about one of his experience of trying to chase down this uh, this bootlegger and this this souped up car, and he he complained that the government gave him these piece of crap cheapo cars and that, that were really no match. But he thought he was doing pretty good, and then the guy just hits it and just takes off and practically disappear. But then. The guy makes a bootleg turn uh, and comes back towards him. And it, it, as he said, it was a game of chicken, and I was the chicken. And so he ran <laughs> off the road. And actually, he was the guy who who caught Junior Johnson at his daddy's steal when Junior got tangled up in a, in a barbed wire fence. <laughs> so check out the Moonshine and Motorsports Racing Podcast, available on YouTube, DailyDownForce.com, and all of your favorite podcasting platforms. And be sure to check out my regular show on NASCAR history, The Scene Vault Podcast. Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to another episode of the Moonshine and Motorsports Podcast. In this episode, you're going to get to know Troy Selberg. I've known Troy for about 30 years now, but we do have our differences. Troy was a crew chief in the sport for several years, and I know where to put the gas on a car and change a tire, but that's about it. Troy is also an executive bourbon steward, and I never knew such a thing existed. Now, in this episode, he's going to tell you all about that gig. He's going to tell you about Statesville's position in the North Carolina spirits trade and a whole lot more. Enjoy. All right, so Troy, first things first. What exactly is an executive bourbon steward? That sounds really impressive. Yeah, so <laughs> executive bourbon steward is by the um, Stafe and Thief organization up in Kentucky, and it is backed by the Kentucky Tourism Department, right? So they're trying to promote bourbon and whiskey in the state of Kentucky. And they have a certification that happens there. And there's a number of different certifications you can get. You can get like a bourbon steward certification, executive bourbon. You can get a master distiller. There's several things you can do. You go to uh, Kentucky, spend a few days up there in the classroom. Uh, You do have to study. Um, I did fail the test the first time, (laughs) right? Because it's a true test. Yeah. Right? It isn't like a uh, a token of, you know, tourism. It's like they want you to know how to truly speak about the spirit and the history 
of how it became what it's become. So there's a lot of uh, folklore out there, you know, what whiskey is, what bourbon is. Everyone, you know, will tell you, well, bourbon's only made in the state of Kentucky, and that's not true at all. You know, it's just folklore. Um, and there's a lot of that out there, so it's, it's really good to, um, to have that background yeah. and to be able to straighten people out in what the truth of whiskey and bourbon truly is. All right, well, this is a North Carolina podcast, cause, so we can't mention Kentucky too often. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, so you go about, you get certified mm -hmm. as, a, as a, an executive bourbon steward. What happens, what happens from there? What, what do you do in that role? So um, what we do at Whiskey Tango Charlie is we do three things, and we do three things very well. We do media, which is a lot of what you see here with podcasts and education. And then the third thing we do is uh, events. So tasting events. We do uh, restaurants, private events, country clubs. Um, we travel around and we help people better understand their palate. Uh, because if you've ever watched uh, any YouTube or social media, uh, there's a lot of people out there that, that talk about whiskeys and bourbons and tequilas and, you know, spirits as, as a whole. And, you know, they're basically pouring a drink and giving you their palate of what they're tasting, what they're smelling. Uh, and what we do is we try to educate you on you because yeah. your palate has developed over a lifetime. So if I was to pour you uh, a whiskey and say, hey, Rick, why don't you go ahead and take this and let's, you know, let's smell it. And you're going to smell something different than what I smell. And as we're smelling it, I'll go, hey, I'm picking up plantains. Well, you may never had had plantains in your life, so you would not know what that smells like. And I use an example of that. Um, from Southern California, you know, grew up in motorsports, and um, I'm kind of ashamed to say what I'm getting ready to say, but uh, my partner, Charles Wilkerson, who is the Charlie of Whiskey Tango Charlie, uh, we're smelling a, a, a whiskey during a podcast, and he's like, Troy, man, I, I'm, I'm smelling honeysuckle. And I was like, Charles, what in the world is a honeysuckle? <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, what? Everybody knows what a honeysuckle yeah. is. And no, I didn't. I didn't grow up taking the, the flower off and sucking the end of it or tasting it. So I had no idea what a honeysuckle smelled like or tasted like. You worked for many years in, in NASCAR. What did some of your former coworkers in the garage think of your gig with Wednesday? Whiskey Tango Charlie. So um, it's really a spin off what we did every day in motorsports. And I'm not talking about, you know, drinking alcohol because we didn't do, you know, we didn't do that, right? We were too busy, you know, racing cars. But it's, it's really about educating others about what you've learned. And so uh, I talk a lot about that in my career on how we, I was able to teach other people everything I knew and they would go on and become much better than myself and the bourbon whiskey thing is the same thing what we're trying to do is teach people about themselves and there's no expert so when you say you know Troy what's an executive bourbon steward right it's someone who practices continuously on sharpening their palate what they smell and what they taste and that's what really uh, the parallel of motorsports is. We continue to try to make things better. And in the bourbon and whiskey world, it's the same thing. It's about educating people about what they enjoy. So you mentioned a couple minutes ago that Kentucky considers itself the only maker of bourbon in the world. You said that that wasn't true. Yeah, it's not. Why, why is that not true? 
So um, Charles and I traveled the country, um, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, uh, Tennessee, um, North Carolina, uh, we're up into West Virginia. There are distilleries all over the country. And some of these distilleries are putting out some very good juice. So, yeah, no, it's, it's not the, the only thing that's out there. Now, Kentucky did put some legislation in place that truly describes what bourbon is. But right now, Missouri has done the same thing. So to be a straight Missouri bourbon, it has paralleled kind of what Kentucky has said, but they've added the grains have to be grown in the state of Missouri, where Kentucky doesn't say that. In your travels, do you sense a kind of rivalry between states? Obviously, they must have some kind of rivalry if Kentucky says it's the only bourbon maker and there's a Missouri bourbon and there's a Texas bourbon. I'm, I'm sure somewhere there's a North Carolina bourbon. How much of a rivalry is there between states? So between the master distillers and the distillery itself, there's not. Uh, they're all in the same vertical. They're trying to do the same thing. A lot of them are working together. Uh, they're all using, you know, uh, a lot of the same technical people like uh, um, Pat Heist at Firm Solutions. Um, Pat goes around the country, him and his partner, and um, they fix fermentation, if it be with ketchup, kombucha, or with bourbons and whiskeys. And he works with all the distilleries. So all the distilleries work together. Now, the bourbon societies, <laughs> right? Yeah. That yeah. are all the way across the country. It's, it's, you know, the Hatfields and McCoys. I mean, they're all fighting, right? Um, but it's not true with the distilleries themselves. What's the difference? Educate me. What's the difference between bourbon, whiskey, beer, moonshine, wine? What's the difference? So that's that's a complex question, right? Hey, we got time. So um, <laughs> the T-shirt you see in, yeah. in the back yeah. here, right? I drank my craft beer distilled. Right, And where that comes from is, uh, it's true that you can throw a Frisbee right now and hit a craft beer distillery. There are a lot of people that have started craft beer distilleries in their garage. It's very easy to ferment grains to make beers. And that's the first step in any spirit. So it starts, whiskey starts out as a beer, right? And then they distill it into a spirit, which is white dog. Then they take that and they put it in a barrel. Depending on how long it stays in that charred oak barrel determines if it's whiskey or bourbon. So to be bourbon or straight bourbon, it needs to be in there for four years. But just to be bourbon, all you have to do is put it in the barrel. And it doesn't have to be a barrel. It could be a bucket. <laughs> right? Because it's truly not defined. So it's funny because Steve Nally, master distiller uh, now at Bardstown Bourbon, will say, if that's a charred oak bucket and you put white dog in it, and pour it right back out. Is it bourbon? Yes. Is it straight Kentucky bourbon? No. So there's a lot of definitions that, that distinguish between whiskeys and bourbons. The most important parts are the age, right? And to be a bourbon, you can only add two things, water or more bourbon, right? So all bourbons are whiskeys, but not all whiskeys 
are bourbons. If that answers your question. Now, we're talking about wines? Yeah, that's, a, that's the same fermenting process, um, but you come out with a totally different juice. All right. Like I mentioned earlier, you once worked in NASCAR. And the legend is that NASCAR basically started on the back roads of North Carolina and North Georgia and uh, Florida uh, with, with, with bootleggers running from the law. How much of that legend is actually true? I think a lot of it is, right? Um, with anything, and we see it today uh, in the in the CBD world, right? So it's becoming more and more popular in different states. It's being legalized, and it's being trafficked in states where it's not legalized, right? So during prohibition, we're human beings, right? We're going to try to cheat the system. And uh, back in the day, there were a lot of people that tried to cheat the system. Some of them did it semi-legally, and some of them did it just out and out illegally. And uh, there is some folklore <laughs> in some of that. You and I talked uh, a couple of days ago when we sat up this interview and North Carolina considers itself the moonshine capital of the world. And I believe that when you and I talked, you said specifically that Statesville, Statesville North Carolina is the moonshine capital of the world. Well, it's not moonshine, right? Okay. So if you, if you look back in the historical records, right? Statesville, North Carolina, and you can tell by the architecture of downtown, was a very prominent city yeah. back in the day, right? So a lot of banks, a lot of nice buildings, right? It was the last stop before going west. And so a lot of commerce happened in Statesville, North Carolina. And so prior to Prohibition, there were 250 rectifiers or stills in and around the Statesville area. And once prohibition happened here in the state of North Carolina, all those people ran off to Kentucky, right? So there's a great argument of Kentucky wouldn't have became who they did if all the people from North Carolina wouldn't have run to the hills of Kentucky. And I'm going to say, not everybody ran to the hills of Kentucky. <laughs> Some of them ran to Wilkes County, <laughs> which makes the, the whole moonshine story pretty true, right? Well, I was going to say if um, Statesville considers itself the moonshine capital of the world, uh, you know, I, I believe Wilkes County is going to have something to say about that. Yeah, so, so the, histor the historical records show that Statesville, North Carolina, was the whiskey capital of the world, not the moonshine capital. Why whiskey? Um, so whiskey's put into a barrel where moonshine isn't. And that's why the clearness of a moonshine is the way that it is. And a whiskey and a bourbon are uh, colored because of the tannins that come out of the woods of the barrels. So whiskey, moonshine, are we talking legal whiskey or illegal whiskey? So prior to Prohibition, that would be a broad yeah. conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. And once prohibition happened and we started to tax things, right, then it had to become legal. Gotcha. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you and Whiskey Tango Charlie, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so UTC? we're uh, all the social medias that are out there, um, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we're, we're doing all of those. Um, and we have a great website out there uh, with some merchandise on it. 
and uh, we're just trying to help you know educate people in the in the world of uh, whiskeys and bourbon. So that's Troy Selberg's story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Join us next time on the Moonshine and Motorsports podcast, and be sure to like and subscribe and comment. We look forward to hearing from you.